tell you about angels. It's, it's amazing and it's overwhelming. As I said, probably 280, 290 times, the Bible makes reference to angels. Now, we could be in this series for a long time, but for right now, we'll let it conclude in this uh, last uh, fifth session because as we come to this uh, closing study on angels, you know, we've examined so many things from Scripture. You recall uh, angels are created beings, probably created all at once by God's majestic hand. And uh, they're ministering spirits. Just to think today, they probably very well ministered to your life and mine. As I was uh, coming to church tonight, Charlotte and I saw a lady. She was over in a ditch, and I guess she was walking to try to uh, get her next-door neighbor to help. And it made me stop and think, how many times have you and I been in close calls, and we don't know but what God's holy angels have protected us, like Jenny shared last Wednesday night. And, of course, they minister before the Father. They minister before the Son. And they minister to all of mankind. And, you know, we looked at the fact that they're comforters. You know... Throughout the Bible, they were used to comfort. They were used to uh, instruct. They were also rejoicing over the salvation. Uh, the Bible says there's presence in the midst of angels over sinners who repent. Now, angels don't understand about salvation. They, they don't understand. They, they long to look into it, the Bible says, because an angel has no idea of understanding what it is to be saved from sin. When an angel falls, an angel falls. There is no such thing as an angel being redeemed. They cannot be redeemed. Why? Because they've experienced so much more than you and I can ever comprehend or imagine in the, in the portals of heaven. But we're going to look at some different uh, passages of Scripture tonight as we conclude. We're going to look at the power of angels. Now, you know, sometimes you have images of, of angels and cherubs that... Uh, you know, they're playing a little harp, and they've got a little harp in their hand, and that's who they are. That's absolutely inconsistent with Scripture. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at some different passages tonight. We're going to look at their power and look at what they can do and do and what they will do in the future. But first of all, the Bible makes it very clear that they excel in strength. Look at number one. And we're going to look at Psalm 103, verse 20. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, you His angels that excel in strength, that do His commandments, hearkening unto the voice of His word. If there's one thing God wants you and me to know about His angels, that they excel, and the word excel means great. One angel has tremendous capacity, and we're going to look at their capacity in just a moment. But in other words, they have great strength, they have great ability. And as you walk through life, God has that capability to give to you and to me whatever angel or angels that we need. In our time of need, you know, we we'll, may not see them. And then again, God could permit us or allow us to see them. That's left up to Him. Uh, I've read some and watched some experiences where people have seen uh, a presence, a, a being that uh, protected them, guarded them. And I shared with you some stories uh, out of uh, yesteryear how some have been protected. One man in the Pacific Ocean, uh, he was, I mean, no land in sight, and all of a sudden there was a presence and, and there was a seagull. And he said, I don't know where it came from, but it just came from heaven and God provided. And so the Bible says they excel in strength and in their service. Why? Because they're servants of God. They're servants from God. They're servants to you and me. They're servants to all of God's created world. Now, I would love to try to figure out how fast they go, but that's beyond my human capability, and here's why. They have the capability to travel from the third heaven where God the Father is, where God the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father, where the angels, all the other angels are, and, and their family and loved ones who are redeemed. And they have the capacity to leave from there and to be on earth in a split second. I can't begin to fathom the time or the, the speed of that, and neither can you. But uh, they do the bidding of God. They excel in strength. You remember in the New Testament, you know, the Bible says the angel rolled back the stone. And I tell you, I can tell you what a stone looks like in Israel that has, has uh, covered the graves. It's amazing the size of those stones. And I saw a first century stone, and, and I guarantee you it'd take a bunch of men to move that stone, and yet one angel can move it. And, of course, you remember that the angel didn't move it for uh, Jesus to get out, but so the women could get in and examine the tomb. But the Bible says that they excel in strength. How much do they excel in strength? Well, I want you to look at number two. 
The Bible says that one angel has the capacity to kill thousands. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 37, 36, Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now, let me give you just a little bit of backdrop to this passage of Scripture in Isaiah and almost the same verses found in, in Chronicles as well. But Assyria was marching on Jerusalem. And uh, Assyria basically were laughing at Jerusalem and was laughing at Jerusalem's God. And uh, basically they said, well, well, your God is no greater than any other God in the universe. And uh, they ascribed to our God, to the Lord God Almighty, just a little God status. Now, because that's what they thought. They thought that the God of the Jews, the God of Jerusalem, the God of God's people was nothing more than just a little God. As a matter of fact, uh, God was going to reveal His might and His power because that's who they thought He was. By the way, can I tell you this? When God needs to reveal His power, He will reveal His power. Don't you dare think that even this virus that's going across the world, that's by accident. Do you not understand that God is in control of this world and does with this world whatever He desires to do and to choose to do with? You say, well, I don't understand all of that. Neither do I. But who are we to question the Creator of the universe? He is not accountable to me. Neither is He accountable to you. He is the sovereign God of the world. And He can do as He will, when He will, the way He will. He is God. Could it very well be, could I tell you what we may be seeing a precursor to? We may be seeing a precursor to the wrath of God that is going to come in the last days when the Antichrist marches across the earth. Folks, this is just a little foretaste of what this world is going to experience. And could it also be that God is using this virus as a wake-up call to people to realize you can die at a very young age? You saw that, uh, that cruise ship, and it became basically an incubator of the, of the sickness. And people were on that cruise liner, and they were having a good time. And all of a sudden, they realized they were in quarantine because of this coronavirus. God is the sovereign, and He is in control of His world. And in this one situation, folks, we've not even touched the hymn of the death that took place here. Now, I know there's been like, last count I heard of, there were 77,000 that had been infected with this virus. There were maybe about 1,000 to 2,000 that had died. But I want you to notice in the text, the Bible says the angel of the Lord smote. In other words, here's the picture. God made it His business to let it be known, I am the God of heaven... And I will let people know I am the God of heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the angel smote 185,000. What was God doing? He was making it very clear. You do not mock the God of heaven and get by. Is it amazing the world we live in? Like, well, people will say anything and everything they want to about God. And then all of a sudden, you know, we can have one sickness and... Can I tell you our, our financial markets are on the uh, are, are in weighed in the balance? <clears throat> Just the day before yesterday, and the only reason that I watch it, because that's where your retirement is and my retirement is, I've never seen the market drop 1,000 points in a day. 600, 700, yes. 500, yes. But never 1,000. And God is making it clear, and He did make it clear to the Assyrians. I want you to understand, to, in this text of Scripture in Isaiah, first of all, they ridicule the name of the Lord. Do you understand that God has always been God and is God, and you do not ridicule the name of the Lord? Assyria said, well, He's, he's, not, a, he's not a sovereign God. You've just got a little God. He's no different than ours. Put Him to the acid test. He will reveal His power, His might, and His majesty. Second of all, he had heaped that he insults on the Lord. Aren't you amazed at the patience of our Lord? What people say about him and how people act toward him and the ultimate patience of our God? 
But Assyria, they had stepped over the boundary line. By the way, you can step over the boundary line. You can bring about, as a matter of fact, some people sin and cause their own death. Some people sin to some, such a degree that, you know, I, I never will forget till my dying day. One man I tried to witness to, and, and there was no spirit of conviction anymore. He said, I guess I'll just die and go to hell. What had he done? He had spurned the grace of God, the mercy of God. He had done it so much, so often, that his heart was so cold and callous. But they ridiculed the name of the Lord. They had heaped insults on the Lord. And the king, what is also as bad, the king had considered himself above all men and above all gods. Isn't it pretty much that's an idea of who we are as the United States of America? You're not going to bring down the United States. We are superpower. We're in the hands of a sovereign, holy God. God can allow one sickness and we're all gone. Now, you say, that don't sound right. We have no right to question our Creator. There's been such mockery through, and, and God has a way of getting people's attention. Don't you know that people are waking up? Americans now, right before I stood up here and right before, uh, right after Mike led that last song, I got... Uh, a notice over my, over my phone that the president even now is speaking to the United States about the coronavirus as I'm preaching to you. In other words, God is in control. His angels, matter of fact, Scripture bears out. They, they bring His devastation. And, now, and, and the king, in this passage of Scripture, ultimately defied the Lord God, and he caused the death of 185,000 Assyrians. They mocked God, they ridiculed God, and the king said, well, you know what, there's nobody greater than me. I am God. You know, there's some people who want you to think that about them, don't they? And God made it very clear. By the next morning, they looked and there was 185,000 a sea. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. You can take the population of Corbin and Williamsburg and London, I know Whitley County is a population of about 38 to 40,000. Imagine everybody dead four or five times over. And so, but would you notice the text? Look at the text on the overhead. Then the angel. How many angels did it say brought about the death? How many? One. Do you not understand and that's why you don't need to be afraid or intimidated as you worship the Lord, follow the Lord. Listen, the Bible says the angel of the Lord camps around those who fear Him. Do you realize who's with you all the time? You have not only the Lord living on the inside of you, the very Holy Spirit abiding within you, but you have the angel of the Lord, the very presence of God's angel and angelic protection. And so to, to think that angels are simply up in heaven playing harps and they don't have the ability, that is absolutely inconsistent with the Word of God. They can, they will, and they do bring death at the command of God. And there is such a, uh, an apathetic approach to the holy things anymore. Have you ever noticed sometimes how, how recklessly we handle holy things anymore? Brother Tommy Fountain, who was our speaker, he said, shared a story with me on Monday morning. He said, this was many years ago when the tremendous preacher was alive, W.A. Criswell. W.A. Criswell, I had the opportunity to hear him. He was pastor of First Baptist Dallas, Texas, and uh, one of the leading preachers in that day and time. And he said he was preaching at an evangelism conference or in a meeting, and there was a group, and he said they was, they was on the platform. And Tommy shared with me, he said they were sort of prancing around. And that's the word that he used. And after they got finished, W.A. Criswell got up and he was preaching. And here's all that he said about what he saw. I've never seen the likes of that in the house of God. Isn't it amazing what we're allowing ourselves to be to, to think of. Folks, this is a holy place. This is holy. As a matter of fact, you know, in the text of Scripture, the Bible makes it very clear. One angel. You don't take lightly the things of God. This is a holy time. 
And that's why God's given you a mind. Do you realize the greatest thing you can do with your mind is put holy things on the inside of it, the truth of the Word of God? Think about it. Everything else doesn't last near like the things of God. Well, look at number three. One angel has the power over natural instincts of wild animals. I love this one. Now, in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible says, My God has sent His angel and has shut the lions, look at the word lions, it's plural, mouths, that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocence he was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Now, to really get into it, it takes a little bit of time, but the reality of it was Daniel was in Babylon, and basically Daniel would not bow down and worship the, the ruler. And there was an edict that anybody who did not bow down, they were going to be either thrown in the fire or they were going to be thrown in the lion's den. Daniel ended up in the lion's den. Now, Darius really didn't want to do what he did, but he was tricked into this edict, and so he went ahead and threw Daniel in, and he was wondering. I wonder if Daniel's God's big enough to deliver him. Now, the stage is set. Here is, here is the king of Babylon, a pagan land, a pagan people, a pagan nation. And the king is saying, I wonder if Daniel's God is big enough to deliver it. Look at the text. Notice every word so carefully. My God. Now, aren't you glad that Daniel said my God? He didn't say a God. Notice, my God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Daniel did not say the lions are suffering from acid indigestion. He didn't say the lions are sick or the lions are, you know, they're, they're asleep. Do you understand? It wasn't just one lion. Probably wasn't just two. Probably a number of lions. And all of a sudden, nobody wanted to eat any flesh. At least you don't think they did. But when the king spoke to Daniel, Daniel was rescued. And you understand what happened next? The men who had him sign that edict, they threw them in, threw their wives in, threw their children in. The Bible says before that they got to the ground, the lions clasped on them. What is God saying through the text? Do you understand God's holy angels can and does protect his servants as he wants them to? I like that. Now we're going to dive something. And uh, I'm fine if I died 145. No, I, I mean, whatever time the Lord wants to take me, that's totally fine. That's his business, not mine. But you understand that our God and his angels, uh, we're seriously important to our God. And, and one of the things that Daniel, he wasn't a bit afraid. And uh, I don't know but what he might have you know, use one of the lines just to sleep on and the line just lay. I don't know what the situation was. I, you can imagine some things in the text. But the reality of it is God has sent his angel. It is not an accident that the Bible just uses the singular angel. One angel has shut all the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. And the reality of the text simply means this. You know, here's God's loving protection over Daniel to validate. Now, can God do that in your life? It sure he can. Now, will he do it? That's left up to him. God knows his plan, his purposes. Now, somebody's going to say, well, why doesn't God keep all of Christians from being martyred? Well, the Bible already makes clear that there are going to be many that have to be martyred. God has already said it in his word. I don't understand it all. But the reality of it is, in this text of Scripture, one angel has the power over natural instinct of wild animals. And, and, and by the way, you know, doesn't God say you have not because you ask not? And, and I was listening to one lady being interviewed. I don't know who she is. I just watched the interview of her, but she said it was as though the angels were listening to the Lord in her experience, and I just listened to it. I don't know the validity of it, but I want to tell you what she said. It was like they were ready to, to move based on the prayers of the people of God. I thought, whoa. We know that. You have not because you what? Ask not. Do you reckon Daniel prayed for the Lord's protection over him? I wouldn't doubt he did. But even if Daniel hadn't prayed, I'm sure God was going to do it anyway because he wanted to make himself known that he is God Almighty. 
Now, something interesting in the text. God did not change the instinct of the brute beast of the lions. Look at the text very carefully. My God sent his angel, has shut the lions' mouths. Why would he shut the lions' mouths if he had changed their instinct? You know, if God had made them docile, God's given you a disposition, a nature, and he's not going to change your nature without a participation, without asking the Lord's forgiveness. And, and do you understand, even in the text, God didn't change the nature of the brute beast, the lions, but the Bible said they, he, just, he just held their mouths at bay. And so, the Bible doesn't give the number of lions, but it does make it clear, one angel. If those lions can... By the way, remember, there are the same number of holy angels today as there was in the days of, of Daniel. You say, how do you know that? There's no evidence in, in Scripture that God created any more angels. All the angels that are, are God's angels now were God's angels in Daniel's day. And by the way, who knows but what you might have had one of Daniel's angels intercede for you at once upon a time. But look at number four. Not only can they control the mouths of animals and can kill a thousand and excel in strength, but one angel can create an earthquake. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, you know that passage. It's the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But there's an intriguing way that verse 2 is, is read, and I want you to notice it. Behold, there was a great earthquake, colon, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, do you understand that the second part of that is qualifying the first part? Behold, there was a great earthquake, and it don't say, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it, the Bible gives the next statement. For the angel of the Lord had descended from heaven. In other words, there was something to do with the presence of the atmosphere and their landing on earth that caused an earthquake. Now, according to some good theologians that I've read on this text, it may have been local. It may not have been a tremendous uh, uh, earthquake that was spread all over the region. It could have been localized like we had the one not too far from here around New Tazewell just a, a little while back. And uh, someone asked us if we felt the, the, uh, the earthquake, and some of you did. Uh, Charlotte and I was traveling about. We didn't know what happened until we stopped at a place, and they said they felt it. But the reality of the text is this. Scripture makes it clear that one angel descending from heaven can create an earthquake. Now watch this. If one angel can descend from heaven and create an earthquake... What about two angels? What about a hundred angels? What about 2,000? What about 20,000? What about 200,000? And someone said I, said, I would not doubt, but there have been the same number of angels that there are human beings that have lived on the face of the earth. If that is the case, one mathematician said there have been at least 25 billion people on the earth. Can you imagine 25 billion angels? I can't, I can't phantom that. But, uh, you know, but the reality of it is, have the power. So what, what's all that all about? What does it mean? Number one, it means God's servants, God's angels. They minister to us, but they minister to us with a seriousness. Don't you dare think for one moment that God is leaving you here on this earth. And, of course, as I said, if we could see this room, we'd find the angels uh, ascending and descending from the throne of God. We'd see demons as well. But they're not going to leave us alone. They're going to protect us, guard us, guide us, comfort us, and give us everything that we need. And uh, I like what Dr. John Phillips said. He put it this way. The ground shook with palsy when its creator died. It shook with pleasure when he arose again. By the, do you not understand there were two earthquakes? One when he died and another when he rose and separated by three days. And the reality of the text of Scripture, here's, here's an earthquake. Why? Because an angel came. One angel coming in such a speed beyond your human comprehension and mine and came and rolled back the door so that the women could go in. Do you understand that in the Old Testament when Elisha was, that was marching against, a, or a group of people was marching against Elisha and his servant that was going to capture him, Elisha just said, Lord, open my servant's eyes that he could see. And he looked and he saw 
a mountain full of chariots of fire. Do you realize if we went outside and if God opened our eyes, we would see chariots of fire and chariots of fire and chariots of fire. As a matter of fact, you remember the Bible says in Hebrews, we are compassed about with a great cloud of what? Witnesses. And are those witnesses angels? I believe so. Are those witnesses those of our family and loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord? I believe so as well. But uh, Scripture records the angel came from heaven and, and was clothed with white. And then fifthly, the angels have power to pour God's wrath on the earth. Now folks, when you get into Revelation chapter 16 and, and that text and following, God makes it very clear he's going to send his angels in the last day to pour out wrath. You know, when somebody says, well, what are, you, what are you saved from? Can I tell you what you're saved from? You're saved from God's wrath. If you ever just want to think about the wrath of God, think about this for a moment. In the end time, God is going to pour his wrath upon all the wicked, all the ungodly. And uh, Revelation 16, 1 says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go! Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Do you understand in the last days, the angels are going to pour out wrath. This idea that God won't do this and God won't do that and God is all love and, and God won't hurt anyone. Do you not understand God will destroy the wicked? God makes it very clear that is his word. That is the truth of scripture. And so here God has assigned his angels. They're going to pour the wrath out. And uh, just to give you an idea, the first angel pours out wrath. And man has sores. Sort of sounds a little bit like a sickness and boils. And the second angel pours out wrath and the sea becomes blood. The third angel pours out wrath and the springs and the rivers become blood. The fourth angel touched the sun and it gave power to scorch mankind. The fifth angel poured out wrath and there was darkness on the earth. The sixth angel poured out wrath on the Euphrates and the water dried up. The seventh angel poured out the wrath of the greatest earthquake on the earth that has ever been or will ever be in the history of the world. How many angels did it take? How many? Seven. It took seven angels to absolutely decimate the earth. We are fearfully and wonderfully made and God's holy hand overshadows us. But I'll tell you what, I thank you when I, I thank the Lord. When I read this text, I think, Lord, I'm not going to go through that. I'm like that song says, I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. By the way, I'm not going to be here when that happens. You say, how do you know? Because God says so. Revelation chapter 3, those spaces between the chapter 3 and chapter 4, the rapture, the church is gone. This is to a world that is experiencing tribulation upon tribulation. And if we think the coronavirus is something, we have no clue what this world is going to be like. All you have to do, can you imagine the sea's blood, the rivers are blood, the streams are blood, everything. And just to think that, you know, they pour out wrath upon wrath upon wrath. Seven angels only. Not 70, not 700, not 7,000, not 70,000, but one angel pours out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And so they've got power. So what are they doing? They're devastating mankind. You say, well, why are they devastating mankind? Because mankind has had ample time. Really, he has. You stop and think about it. If the rapture took place today, you say, you know, I feel sorry for my lost family, and we do. But let's be real honest. They've had time to repent, haven't they? They've been given plenty of time to repent. They've heard the songs of God, ignored them. They've heard the message of God, ignored them. They've heard the teaching of the Word of God. They've heard so many things and ignored them. You know, we have so much that we can listen to, and we don't even realize it. One of the things I... I turn on my Sirius radio and turn on to that enlightened channel. And uh, I never had heard the song before, but it's by the Wisnets, one plus two plus three. If you've never heard it, you need to listen to it. I, I didn't know the song, but I found myself humming to it. But folks, you and I know that we are a world 
that is bound for destruction. And who's going to do it? God's holy, mighty, wonderful angels. Now watch this. Angels who lovingly guard and protect and care for the righteous will destroy the wicked. But you can understand that. What would I do if I saw a wild animal come after my, my granddaughter, my grandson? What would I do to that animal? If there was a baseball bat, I'd beat it to death. You say, oh, pastor, you don't need to say that. If there's a wild animal, I would. What will you do to protect your loved ones? Isn't it amazing that we've got so disoriented we kill human life and we protect animals? I mean, we're warped. But God makes it very clear. And I love animals. I've loved every dog that I've had. But God makes it very clear. Well, look at number six real quickly. One capacity, one angel has the capacity to take hold of Satan and bind him for a thousand years. I love this verse. In Revelation 21 and 2, John said, and I saw, I observed, the word carries with it, I, I, I saw. And if you've never been to a place and you are finally there, it makes all the difference in the world. Places that I never thought of before in Jerusalem, I saw, I've been there, I know what it's like. And uh, Brother Ryan will know in just a few months after he goes. But look what it says. I saw an angel come down from heaven. Notice how, how many it says, one angel. Having the key of the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, do you reckon Satan wants to be bound? I don't know of anybody that wants to be bound in chains. I mean, you watch sometimes on some of these shows, and uh, there was a show, Cops, and, and uh, may still be on. And people will run all over the creation trying not to get chained or get bound by handcuffs. But watch this. When the time comes for millennium to take place, here's the angel. Now, it won't be visible to our eye, but God says it's going to happen. Here's John declaring it. He watches one angel. Now, if Satan is so all-powerful as we like to make him to believe, and some people, well, you know what you don't know? I mean, God or the devil? You know, I mean, it just depends on which one. Folks, Satan is a created being. God is the sovereign of the universe. And we need to get their thinking right. And here is one angel comes from God, comes from heaven, and he has a chain, and the Bible says he binds Satan, and watch this, he cast him for a thousand years into the bottomless pit. Now, you know, he don't come out any happier after the thousand years. But here's, here's the point. One angel, by God, has the capacity to bind Satan. One angel will see Satan. One angel will take Satan and will chain him. Now, folks, the word in the literal language means a literal chain, a divine Eternal chain by the power of God. And uh, God's binding is going to be clear. Here's, here's Satan, he's, he's bound. Now, why is that text so important? Look at the text again. I saw an angel come down from heaven. There wasn't a fight. The Bible does not say Satan threw a punch and then the angel threw a punch. Satan threw another punch and then the angel threw another punch. And you didn't know who was going to win till the end. Now, I wouldn't dare do it to Brother Ryan, but, uh, you know, I'm probably a little bit bigger than he is. He might be able to take me anyway. I wouldn't dare try to bind him. But the point is, here is one angel that binds, and, and John uses four words. The serpent, the dragon. The devil. Say, you reckon he's trying to get across a point? He said, I want you to understand that one angel of God who are protectors of us. See, that's why Satan can't do to us anything he wants to. You've heard me say it different times, and I'll say it, I'll say it again tonight. And I don't hesitate to say it, and I'm not trying to... Uh, if Satan is so all-fired powerful, why don't he kill me where I'm standing? 
If Satan is so powerful and so mighty, why don't he destroy me while I'm standing in your presence? If he wants you to believe that he can do whatever he wants to. There's two things the devil will use on us till the day we die. Two things, and if you learn them, you will win a lot of things when it comes to warfare. Number one is fear. You ever had any bullies in school that made, made you fearful? Picked on you? Oh, I would never will forget little Eddie. He picked on me and picked on me riding the bus up No Town Road. And one day he said, I'm going to get off at your stop. And I'd had enough of him. And I said these words. I remember saying them. I said, I wish you would. Now you say, surely, preacher, you wasn't going to tangle with him. Oh, I was, and I was going to wear him out. I'd had enough of his mouth. I'd had enough of his bullying. And I, 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 okay, I called checkmate. Okay. You, I was just doing something very innocent and what he little kid. And he's just trying to bully. He got off. He said, well, I would if I didn't have to go home. That little smart aleck. I pray he's been redeemed and maybe passed a good church someplace. But that was when we was kids. But do you understand? Satan loves to bully us. Satan loves to say, you better not count for God. You better watch out. I'll wear you out. If Satan is so powerful, why don't he do something to this angel? If Satan is so mighty and so big and so awesome, why don't he just wear this angel out and say, angel, you're not going to bind me. I'm going to trump you because he knows he is a liar. And he's been lying to mankind since the beginning of time. And he lies to us so much that we believe his lies. And then the second one is fear. You know, he tries to create fear in us. Tries to get us to believe we are somebody we're not and that we're not somebody we are. Well, lastly, real quick, time's run out. Angels have the power to transport us to paradise at death. I love this verse. I've alluded to it. Uh, different times in this series, but I want to leave us with this one in our last point in this study. Luke 16, 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Look at the words because they're so important. And was, say that next word with me, carried by the angels. Do you understand it takes one angel to bind Satan? Are you listening? Takes one angel to bind Satan. But angels in the plural are going to be around you and me as we are ushered into glory. I love that thought, don't you? Here we are, we're getting ready to leave this world. And Ralph and I have different times. We've talked about going home to be with the Lord and, and uh, played some uh, just some snippets of people who've evidently had some after-death experiences and what they saw and experienced and but here is the rich man, or the, the beggar rather. The rich man died and he's buried. But here's a poor beggar, not even given a funeral. Probably took his body out to, to the garbage heap just outside of Jerusalem. And there's where he was laid. By the way, you notice that's happening more and more, don't you? People, there are, people are finding bodies everywhere. And you say, well, it's sad, these people. But yeah, but if they were a child of God, they were carried into heaven. Here is... Here's the poor beggar. But the Bible says here's, here's what happened. The angels, they came and they took his spirit the moment he breathed his last breath and they ushered him into Abraham's bosom, which is a euphemism for paradise. Literally carries the meaning of paradise. And the Bible says here are the angels. And here's the poor beggar. Can you imagine... All of a sudden, you're out of your human body. All of a sudden, you're floating through the air in a speed. And all of a sudden, you look around and there's angels so around your presence. I don't know how many there are. And all of a sudden, they carry you. I like that word carry because some of you are afraid of flying. I've tried to talk Charlotte into flying sometime. I'll never talk my daughter into flying. She's made it very clear I'm never getting on a plane. I'm like what I heard a fellow say one time, I don't want to get on the plane, I want to get in the plane. You can get on the plane if you want to, I'm getting in the plane. But the Bible says here is the poor beggar. And he was carried. 
How many angels were there? The Bible don't say. But here's what you do know. More than one. Who all were they? You know. And by the way, angels do not all look alike. You know, just like you and I are human beings and we have a personality and each of us look different, I believe that's the same way with angels. Why? Because God loves variety. Isn't it amazing? All of us have a face, but we're different. All of us have eyes, but they're different positions. And, uh, you know, I look around and I think, God makes us so look different with just these component parts on our face. But the Bible says, here's that one poor beggar. You know... What a comforting thought as we come close to the end of our life. Don't you worry about that time when you get ready to leave this world. Don't you worry about what's going to happen because you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. you followed him. You've tried to walk with him the best you can. And I don't know but what those moments before you walk out of this life, God will give you a glimpse. And what I heard Tony Evans say, he said, people I've known that have walked with the Lord, he gives them a glimpse right before they leave this life. And I think of people who have been faithful servants. I think, Sonny, of Miss Naomi. I think how she served the Lord, your mother served the Lord, and think of so many others, your family served the Lord. And uh, but God's going to bring his angels to carry us home. Most importantly, aren't you glad that you're going? And Father, we thank you so much. For the riches of your word. Oh, blessed be your name. Thank you for your protective angels around us so much. In so much we don't even comprehend or understand. But you lovingly protect us in so many ways. And Father, I pray. As we live our life that we just live it in obedience to you. Walking with you. And just thanking you each day of our life. For your presence, protection, your your holy angels around us. And Lord, I pray for each and every person here tonight and their family and their children and grandchildren that you would just protect their children and grandchildren in a very special way. Father, we thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you face to face and meeting those ministering spirits that have walked with us all through life, your holy angels. 